Thanks for joining us tonight for this first edition of MMT Ed Q&A. With our capacity to travel limited at present, we thought we needed different ways to deliver our educational message. There's a lot written about and said about MMT now, but much of it in our view falls short of what's reasonable. MMT Ed Q&A is one way that we can build a deeper understanding about MMT in the community. And what we're going to do is answer your questions and introduce special guests so that we get a diverse opinion. And we're not sure whether it'll be weekly yet. We'll see how our resources cope, but tonight's the start. A few brief observations by way of introduction about MMT Ed. It operates in the tradition of the free university or the old trade union schools. And what that allows, allowed workers to do was to gain broad knowledge outside their normal working hours. And so you had a lot of men in those days who were manual workers, who were extremely well read. And the idea of community education outside formal processes and providing that for no expense to workers is the tradition that we're hoping to emulate. We offer, and we should make it quite clear, we're offering no formal accreditation or qualifications at this stage. We're hoping in due course, as we expand our uh, capacities and our penetration, that we will be able to make arrangements with traditional universities and uh, uh, get some accreditation and, award, and pathways into award courses. But at the moment, there's no, no holding out of anything of that type. What we're going to do though is offer a range of different teaching modes and uh, we'll be running formal stream lectures which will be open to all. There'll be live sessions available to the globe. We'll offer super, supervised online tutorials in small classes with class participation interacting uh, through the internet uh, with the teaching staff. We will run master classes, so specialised, more technical probably events uh, uh, in cities, in so physical presence, but also online. Uh, we'll also offer, of course, resources for online self-paced learning. And uh, we will offer on demand, depend, uh, through negotiation, uh, small group, uh, specialised uh, classes, uh, probably very technical, and those uh, services will be the only services that we'll seek to charge for. At present we're trying to raise funds to finish off the creation of our infrastructure and our systems. It's quite a complex process uh, we've discovered to create an educational institution that's uh, globally available and uh, we, we need funds for that. We need staff, we need technical skills, uh, and we're slowly putting that together. And we hope to start offering a limited range of uh, courses by September. I don't promise that, but we're getting fairly close to that. So, uh, and in time we'll add courses and teachers and programs and uh, uh, hope to offer a diverse range of courses. And we'll have a variety of teaching staff involved and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very confident you'll enjoy participating with uh, people that you normally wouldn't participate with in a uh, small group environment. And um, apart from those services I mentioned, for equity reasons we're going to offer all of our courses for free. That's why I need to raise donations because we want to uh, we want never to exclude anyone who wants to learn for, the, uh, uh, for dint of not being able to afford the financial uh, entry. And it's too difficult to have exemptions and all of that, so I think it just should be in the free university. And with that, it takes me to the first question. And this was a question, and normally we're, we're aiming to... Um, run the questions chronologically so we've be, we have a submission uh, 
uh, form on our on the mmt.org website and we've had a lot of questions so far and it's going to take a while to get through them and normally I'm we're aiming to get through them in a sequential way in a chronological way but this particular question which was received very recently is a good way to start because it's very easy to answer and it comes from Joshua who's in Melbourne Australia and he asks will the MMT courses be restricted to those with a background in economics and financial studies and the answer to that question is simple we're aiming to be an inclusive open uh, organization and we're aiming to tailor our educational courses and our pedagogy to meet that inclusion and of course we're wanting to bring people to sophisticated levels of understanding of MMT and uh, uh, that of the sort of sophistication that you would get uh, by participating in a, a, a beginning or an intermediate or even an advanced university course. But we're aware that a lot of learning about MMT is it's very similar to learning a new language. And we learn that when we're young and we learn it through very simple heuristics and we learn it in, in uh, 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 using simple concepts uh, in, a, in a graphics and sounds and all of that. So we're aiming, and we're in design mode at the moment, we're aiming to have a sort of like a K-12 program as well as the more advanced programs. So at the moment, the, the introductory courses that we'll start offering soon, hopefully by September, will be uh, a, a part, provide a pathway to uh, entry towards university level, college level uh, standards and uh, we'll be using the, the macroeconomics textbook that I wrote with Randy Ray and Martin Watts as the, uh, the, the vehicle for that. But over time we will introduce uh, some very basic material and bring people up to speed over time. So we're aiming to be inclusive and uh, no background in economics or financial studies will be needed. Now, you know, from my perspective, um, having a background in economics or financial studies is possibly a disadvantage because you've got so much cognitive dissonance to some, so much baggage to jettison. Uh, and, and what I've found is that uh, talking to engineers and people who haven't, and people from physics tradition, and uh, some of those traditions, they, they uh, pick up the concepts of MMT very quickly. So the answer is no, and uh, stay tuned. Here's question two. This is from Ted. And Ted, Ted's an, uh, an Australian person, and he's been following the, um, the debate within Australia since the pandemic. And uh, what's, what Ted was wondering, and he's obviously understood that the Reserve Bank of Australia, our central bank, has been, for the first time since March, been buying government bonds, uh, both at uh, federal and state and territory level. And so far they've bought about $40 billion worth. And he heard uh, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, on TV recently, talking about how the bond market is in good shape because it says oversubscribed issues and he couldn't put those facts together and uh, he wondered what was going on. Well, the, the, the two statements are, are factually true and what, what we need to uh, appreciate is how the bond market is structured and how bonds enter the, enter the bond market and then how they're traded. Now, the, each country has nuances and institutional differences and terminology differences and what have you. But broadly speaking, the bond markets work in a very similar way right across the globe. So what I'm going to say today is, is, is Australian knowledge but it's applicable in a general sense to all bond markets. And the way the system works 
is that the government has what's called a primary issue. And uh, there's a select group of uh, uh, bond traders, bankers and, and, uh, and institutions who make the market, as the jargon goes. And what that means is that these individuals are, uh, uh, participate in the primary issuing of the, of the government bonds. And so the Australian Office of Financial Management, which is a, uh, a, a division of the Australian Treasury, uh, they announce regular auctions, very regular, weekly sometimes, where the, they announce a certain amount of volume of debt is to be sold, so uh, uh, and, uh, uh, some billions, and they invite the bond, the, the, the special bond dealers to then uh, tell, tell it through an auction process uh, how much they're they want by way of yield to to take that debt. Now then the, the auction process proceeds and of course the the government starts to allocate the debt according to the lowest yield bid uh, and, and then if that if if say one investor wanted to buy it all that the lowest bid investor would get it all but typically they spread it out and the bids are spread across a range and uh, at the end of uh, and the last dollar of uh, debt that's issued is a, a, is at some yield that sets the highest yield that's uh, going to be paid um, so then that debt then is enters the primary market through that auction process now what happens then is that uh, that debt then becomes a tradable vehicle within what's called the secondary market. And this is where, where the clients of the banks and uh, what have you then start acquiring that debt. So superannuation funds, pension funds, uh, local governments, what have you. Uh, and, and that debt then gets freely traded until it matures and the last holder of that debt gets repaid by the government in the maturity process. Now, the, to, to, so, so what the Prime Minister was talking about in terms of oversubscription, he was talking about the bid to cover ratio. Now, this is, this is how many bids there are in the primary issuing process for the subscription that the government is offering. So, for example, if the government's offering uh, $10 billion at a particular auction, and that would be large. Uh, just, just the other day, they, they sold $19 billion, which was huge, one of the, the highest on record. Uh, so they say they're, high, they're issuing or wanting to issue $10 billion worth of debt. And the bids that come in uh, sum to $50 billion. Well, then we call the bid to cover ratio five. There's five times more bids than there is debt to be sold. And typically the bid to cover ratio in the Australian bond market is quite high. And more very recently, it's been very high. Now, the, the uh, uh, characters who are always predicting that the government will go broke and the the bond markets will stop uh, participating, uh, always claim, oh, the bid to cover ratio will drop below one, which means that there wouldn't be enough people wanting to buy the debt that was available. Now, you know, and this is often in the financial press, they talk about that. And, uh, uh, but if you examine the data from the Australian Office of Financial Management, the bid to cover ratios have averaged, you know, something like, I can't remember exactly, but about 3.6 uh, for many, since the AIFM started in the, in the early 80s. And so uh, there's always an oversubscription. Now, what, what the Reserve Bank has been doing is buying $40 billion worth of Australian government debt in the secondary markets. So what the Reserve Bank does is goes into the secondary market, 
and, and buys the debt, makes a bid and buys the debt off of whoever's holding at that point. And by their motivation, this is so-called quantitative easing, and their motivation is by pushing up the bond price, they push down the yield. And if they push down the yield on government bonds, say at a 10-year maturity, then other yields on corporate debt and the investment grade debt at that maturity point uh, uh, also drop. And so the idea of quantitative easing is to try to reduce interest rates uh, to encourage uh, private borrowers borrowing, investing and stimulating the economy that way. The only problem is that when times are tough as they are now, nobody really wants to borrow because there's so, so much uncertainty that they don't want to build capital equipment and uh, plant, invest in plant and machinery and new technologies until they're pretty sure that they're going to, uh, we're going to come out of this at some point soon. And so QE is an incredibly ineffective way of operating. So Ted, I hope that answers your question. Uh, the two statements are perfectly true and they refer to the, the different structures of the bond market. Okay, so the next question, and a lot of the questions we've received are uh, uh, worded differently, but they amount to the same question. So we put these together. And from Demetrius, you see what does MMT propose regarding fiscal space for countries that peg their currency to another major currency, for example, the US. And he was particularly interested in Saudi Arabia. Uh, from Fabio, he asked, could you address the issue of the degree of open policy space in the case of emerging markets in terms of MMT from an MMT perspective? And Francisco asked a very similar question. How does MMT resolve possible external imbalances in a weak currency economy? Now, I thought about who would be good to be my special guest this week. And uh, I thought no one better than Professor Fadel Kaboob from Denison University, one of the uh, uh, MMT scholars who's added so much work on developing economies and it was my pleasure we had a, a nice chat earlier in the week. Uh, I've edited out all of the, the, the personal stuff and uh, let's hear from Fidel. Well those are those great, are great questions, questions and they're all related to uh, the, the concept, concept of monetary sovereignty, sovereignty and how it applies in, in developing countries or emerging markets. markets. And I, I, always I always have to, have to you know, you know say, say it carefully when I say, how does MMT apply to developing countries? Because what we're, we're applying is the analytical framework. framework. We're not applying policies per se. So the analytical framework, you can think of it as, you know, as, as gravity. Do you apply gravity or do you observe it? Learn how to deal with it and learn how to use it for, you know, for a good purpose. Uh, so, uh, so MMT, MMT in, in a sense, sense is, is, is the same, same thing. thing. You, you learn it, it you observe, observe how the system works, works with that MMT, MMT lens, lens, and then, and then you, you figure out how to manipulate, how to move bits and pieces and, pieces and, and, the, and the mechanics of the economy, economy to get to better get results, results, to get the desired the results. results. So, so in, in, in developing countries and emerging markets, including countries that peg their currency or use a fixed exchange rate system and so on, you have to figure out what are the structural issues that they're dealing with that lead them into that uh, situation. So it turns out, first from an MMT perspective, the way we kind of start our analytical framework, we say a monetarily sovereign country is a country that can issue its own currency, that can tax its population in the same currency, which is pretty straightforward. Most countries can do that. But it's also a country that can issue debt denominated in its own currency and only in its own currency. In other words, it doesn't have external debt. And that's really difficult for developing countries for reasons that I'll explain. And related to that, it's a country that doesn't fix its exchange rate. Um, on that last bit, when people say, well, you MMT or say you can't fix your exchange rate, well, then you're for a free a floating exchange rate. And if you do that, it's going to be a disaster the next morning. Well, notice I didn't say that's what you need to do tomorrow. 
but I said, this is what it takes to get your full monetary sovereignty or a high degree of monetary sovereignty and to open up that fiscal policy space. So the question is, how do we get to a situation where you can actually do that as a country, as a developing country? So then you use this framework to figure out what are the structural issues that developing countries have are having trouble with. It turns out that external debt and that external debt that leads you or forces you to fix your exchange rate, the source, the root cause of that external debt is usually centered on a handful of issues. One is um, heavy reliance on food imports, lack of food sovereignty. Number two, heavy reliance on energy imports, uh, fossil fuels in, in particular. Uh, number three, it's a, it's a deficiency, structural deficiency in the industrial system that uh, creates a scenario whereby developing countries tend to specialize in exporting low value added content, uh, extractive industries in particular, but they also specialize in importing high value added content. And when they, when they aspire to industrialize or when they're told to industrialize, it makes things worse because they tend to specialize in assembly line type of industry where you have to import the capital, you have to import intermediate goods, you have to import even more energy, right? To run those industries and to, you know, to, to fuel the industrial development. So those industries, that particular type of industrialization is part of the trap. So you end up importing all the basic necessities, food, energy, medical equipment, and all the things you need to industrialize, quote unquote industrialize. And as a result, that puts downward pressure on your exchange rate, which means if you don't attempt to artificially lift up the value of your exchange rate, to artificially appreciate the exchange rate, you're gonna have food riots the next morning because everything you import with a devalued currency is gonna be more expensive. So food more expensive, medical resources more expensive, fuel is gonna be more expensive. And we've seen this repeatedly in developing countries. So notice MMT doesn't tell you to devalue your exchange rate and everything will be fine the next morning. But MMT is saying what you need to address is the root cause of those food riots and energy riots, which is your excessive reliance on food imports which means the root cause is lack of food sovereignty. So you need to invest and mobilize domestic resources to build more resilience in your economy in terms of food sovereignty and energy sovereignty. And in terms of moving away from this particular type of industrialization that forces you into extractive industries and invest strategically in areas that allow you to over time gradually kind of move up the, the, the ladder, so to speak, by um, strategically and selectively choosing the types of industries that you want to commit your resources and your labor and your energy towards. And those should be industries that allow you to extract more value added as opposed to extract, you know, more of your labor and energy and water resources for, for exports. So that's kind of the, the beginning of the, of the framework. Uh, and if and if that makes sense to people, then our conversation should be focused on how do we, as a democratic society, hopefully, organize our political system, economic system, to prioritize those structural foundations that will keep people employed, that will allow us to reach higher standards of livings and better quality of life without having to sacrifice people's livelihood, without having to suffer massive amounts of inflation, and most importantly, without having to suffer the consequences of lack of economic sovereignty by having an external entity, whether it's uh, the IMF or other international creditors, dictate your economic policy and impose restrictions on your domestic uh, economic policy. And as a result, impose restrictions on your uh, public policy decision-making process, and as a result, on your on your democracy. Right. I, I often make the point that what what an MMT understanding allows is that uh, a, a, a currency sovereign government can always make sure all the available productive resources are fully employed, but that doesn't necessarily equate to material prosperity if the available resources aren't there. So in terms of what you've just said, 
what's the sort of time frame do you do you see for a, an economy that can actually have both full employment and a, and an emerging material prosperity in an environmentally sustainable way i mean you, you know you're talking about degrees of currency sovereignty but what time frame i mean i remember back to uh, when milton friedman was asked how long would it take to deflate back to a natural rate he said oh 15 years of austerity so you know what yeah. what what what's your temporal consideration there yeah that's a that's a good question so it, it clearly varies from from country to country so let me let me put it this way um you know mmt is to me especially when you think of developing countries that the real constraint, as we as we always discuss, is is inflation, and inflation is really the centerpiece of, of the debate when it comes to developing countries. So, inflation in the developing world happens, you know, comes from a variety of sources. One is shortage of productive capacity at the local level, um, you know, and, and that means physical, technological, you know, skilled labor type of uh, know-how. Uh, another important source of inflation is domestic market power, you know, price setters at the local level who charge more because they can. So that kind of inflation, you're not going to get rid of it by spending more or spending less. You get rid of it by taxing and regulating their market power out of existence. In other words, by you know using public policy in a democratic system to make that bit of the market more democratic, more competitive. But it gets a bit more complicated in the developing countries, especially in the informal market, and especially in non-democratic societies, or even in some democratic societies, where because you rely on so many imports of basic necessities, such as food, such as fuel, such as medical equipment, you end up with countries creating exclusive import and export licenses yeah. that privilege a particular business class, and in some cases, particular individuals that you can name in some countries and identify who have this exclusive market power, and as a result, have a vested interest in not creating a domestic economic sovereignty in that particular space. So they want to always import wheat. They want to always import oil. They want to import, you know, whatever the market share that they control. So they'll do whatever they can politically, economically, to make sure that there is no alternative other than using their space. And because in many cases they deal in uh, commodities that have global prices. So when oil prices go up, for example, you know, domestic energy prices go up, but then when global oil prices come down, they don't necessarily lower their prices accordingly. So there is this huge extractive force at the local level. Uh, and this is kind of the formal business world, right? Uh, so that's a major source of inflation, a major impediment to a transition to a sustainable economy, to you know, fighting climate change, to a prosperous um, uh, domestic economy. But then you have informal networks, especially cross-border trafficking, for example. Uh, where the more you have a, of a breakdown in the economic and political system, the more those networks thrive, uh, especially in developing countries. And those networks are controlled by, you know, uh, you know, cross-border traffickers who don't really have any issue trafficking in people, trafficking in weapons, trafficking in, in milk and in, in oil and gasoline and whatever it takes, right? It's all business. Uh, so that makes it dangerous in, in cases where you're dealing with uh, illicit drugs and weapons and terrorism. Um, and that's where you interface generally with corruption in the, in the military, in the police. And that's when things get out of control. Right. Uh, so we see this quite a bit in developing countries. So that kind of inflation that's kind of coming out of market power, corruption, cross-border trafficking, um, it is probably the most difficult one to undo. And people will literally fight you to death not to give up that market power. So these are the structural impediments that developing countries deal with on a systematic basis. Uh, so to go back to your question in terms of time frame, how do you transition without addressing those institutional structural issues? Um, th there's really no timetable for, for these things. Uh, um, and that's why in any society, it's important not to have, you know, the plan for the government to do this. That's why you have to have, you know, a popular buy-in 
right? Because a democratic society, a democratic government, hopefully a government of the people, by the people, for the people, you have to have you know, kind of a popular buy-in from the general public that this is, you know, this better future is within reach and that these are the structural impediments that we all agree need to be addressed. And that's where you get a transition away from corruption, a transition away yeah. from, you know, existing uh, power structures into new, more democratic, more transparent market structures. Good. So there is no timetable. There is no magic uh, timetable for these things, but it's important to recognize uh, what are the impediments? Because if we if we yes. can't see the impediments, then we can't design policies to, to address them. And if we speak in broad terms, we say corruption, corruption, corruption. Everybody knows corruption is a problem. But what type of corruption and how does it interface with your daily life? How does it interface with economic transformation? That's really the part that I, I think, you know, MMT economists in the developing world are clearly seeing. And that's why you see increasingly more mainstream trained economist who for you know uh, an entire career have tried to deal with the issue of inflation with the issue of economic development from a genuine perspective have not found anything practical in the mainstream literature in the mainstream public policy space and in the last few months in the last few years we've seen increasingly more people saying this is the framework we've been waiting for we've been looking for I've, I've had some you know economists tell me that i i guess now i have a name for this thing that i've been looking for right it's called mmt That's um, good. so we we just need more uh of uh our colleagues to engage with development economists uh, around the world and to engage with them not in a way that says well this is how we do it in the us now go and apply it yeah. but engage with providing the the MMT lens, the framework, and engaging in a reciprocal relationship that says, you know, we have this lens, you have an institutional understanding of what's happening in a particular country, in a particular region. Let's see how we can interface these things and unpack yeah. some of the structural problems. Look, that's terrific, Fidel. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks thank for, you. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure speaking to you. Okay, cut. I, I was able to. Okay, wasn't that wonderful? That was uh, Professor Fadal Kaboob, who I spoke to earlier in the week, and I hope uh, Demetrius, Fabio, and Francisco. I hope that answers your question. Their questions we got, get a lot, and. Um, um, <laughs> Sorry about that. There are questions we get a lot and um, uh, they deserve uh, the length of that sort of answer. So that's it for tonight. Uh, we're obviously, we're aiming to keep this to a 30 minute segment. We went a bit over tonight, but we'll get better. That, in part, that was because of my introduction and we'll get better. And uh, I'm hoping next week to have another special guest and uh, we'll, we'll just work our way through the questions. Uh, what we're, uh, we rely on donations to build the infrastructure and to, to pay for things that, that uh, are required to make this sort of uh, service available. So you can donate through PayPal at, through mmted.org uh, or through uh, my blog. Uh, or you can write to me at bill at mmt.org and I'll give you bank details. You can either pay in Australian dollars or we can arrange uh, tax deductible payments within the US for US taxpayers. So please help if you can. Uh, it's not a cheap thing and we're slowly building but we need more funds. So that's it for this week. And we'll be back probably next week. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching and thanks for Fidel for appearing tonight. Take care.